Of course, it had to be One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest. And joining us right now on the phone, we are so excited and honored and proud and feel very, very lucky to be joining us to talk about the 40th anniversary of One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest and Jack Nicholson. Please welcome Oscar-winning producer Michael Douglas. You are on with Scott and Alicia. Wow, what an intro. <laughs> <laughs> we are so excited to talk to you. Uh, we're just saying we have to do a profiles on you, <laughs> definitely. <laughs> but talking about One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest, I just watched it again recently. Why do you think it still holds up after so long? It's, it's a, a timeless movie, Alicia, about independence, about fighting the system, about individuality. And it was a great book. Uh, it's required reading in 20th century uh, American lit classes. Um, and I think it's just a, a, a timeless story about uh, being independent in society. Well, originally, your father, the great Kirk Douglas, had owned the rights for a long time, passed them on to you. You produced the movie with Saul Sense. And your father wanted to play McMurphy, and Jack Nicholson got the job. How did that happen? <laughs> well, first of all, I, my hat goes off to my father. At the height of his career, he just made a movie called Spartacus, and he went back to Broadway, and he optioned this book, One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest, had it made into a play and did it on Broadway. It wasn't the success that he'd hoped for, and he was going to try to transfer it from a play into a movie. He tried for a number of years and then sold the rights, or was trying to sell the rights. I had then read the book, loved it, and said, look, Dad, let me have a chance to run with it. And it took me about five years. And by then, you know, everybody's career changed. My father was a lot older then. And although to this day, <laughs> I think he holds this, uh, he holds this on, my, on my case, <laughs> I had to remind him that the director is the person who makes the final decision on casting. <laughs> Wow. I love that. Can you tell us when you first met Jack and what was your impression of him? Well, you have to remember, Alicia, that the earlier movies, even Easy Rider, Five Easy Pieces, Jack was seen, I wouldn't say a sensitive young man, but he was seen a lack of, <laughs> he was seen sort of an intellect and a, and a gentle uh, soul. He was not the first person you would think of to play R.P. McMurphy, even though it turned out you know, to, to be brilliant. Um, but I'm, we were talking to the director, Hal Ashby. Uh, you made it Harold and Maude. And yes. Hal was doing a picture with Jack called The Last Detail, where Jack played a career ar a Navy officer. And he said, you got to look at this film. And we took a look at it, and then we realized that he was, he was right for it. And Jack always wanted to do this part even though we've been talking maybe to Marlon Brando and to Gene Hackman, people who seemed more right at the time, Jack had expressed a passion for it. So I met him, you know, when we were, when we were auditioning and talking about it, and he was a quiet, gentle man. Uh, but after seeing the, uh, the last detail, we knew he was right. Wow, wow. What was it that impressed you the most? Like when you're, when you're up in Salem, Oregon, filming this movie, what was it that impressed you the most about his technique when you saw him in, in, in action? And, and how, how much did he collaborate with you, with Louise Fletcher, and especially with Milos? Jack does a tremendous amount of homework, but when you come to the set, you never see it. Interesting. He has the ability to make it seem like he's just right off the cuff. But he actually spends a tremendous amount of time behind the scenes working really hard. I think the other magical thing that Jack has is being in front of the camera allows him to be more open and vulnerable than he is actually in real life. He's, he's a shy gentleman, he's a shy man, but when he's in front of the camera, it allows him an excuse to open up uh, his whole persona. And I think that's part of his real magic. He's such a he's so great in this role, and he's so explosive at several times during the movie. Do you remember a scene in particular which really blew you away? Well, um, I, I I think that uh, the scene uh, when he makes up when they when they cut off the um, the television, oh, yes. yes, and he's not able to watch the series, 
and he makes it all up in front of the guys and persuades them. I mean, that was a scene that really struck home. I also think right after the uh, the big party they have, there's a moment that's actually a silent moment where he's just standing there, and I watched him look out behind the camera at all of us there as if none of us were there. And it was such a haunting moment about what was going to happen uh, coming up. But I've told a lot of people, we would have those the group therapy scenes, and you could have a camera on Jack for 10 minutes, and maybe he was not saying anything. He was simply reacting to what was going on in the group therapy scenes, and it's a, it's a master acting class. Yes. Oh, God. Uh, he just yeah. is, he's just right on the edge and, and right on the moment all the time. Wow. Wow. But when you were shooting on location, what, you know, you basically were shooting at a, at a mental institution. What was it, what was it like being on the set like that, like 24 seven? And how hard was it for Jack to be on a set where nobody broke character? Well, what had happened is we had two weeks, <clears throat> Scott, of uh, rehearsal before we started shooting. And the first week, Jack couldn't be there because of prior commitments. The doctor who ran the hospital, who also actually plays the doctor in our movie, he assigned each of the actors to different real group therapy m meetings in the hospital with real patients. Uh, and they were not identified as actors. So each of them went in pretending to be a patient in these group therapy sessions. And so they were really kind of inundated. Some of the actors were actually living in the uh, institution at night rather than going back to the hotel. Oh, jeez. <laughs> so when Jack arrived, he arrived like a week late. And he just, he just kind of got there. And, uh, and it was tough because I remember he had a big beard because he wanted to play it with a big beard. <laughs> and we had a big fight about that or <laughs> had a big discussion. Uh, that, no, he, he didn't need I know he felt like he needed to be like a bear and have that size, but uh, he, we, we, he finally went along with us and went without it. But we were having lunch in the commissary uh, at a little cafeteria at the institution, and he pushed his tray away, and he walked outside, and it's like his first day. I went, oh, my God, we have a problem. What's wrong, Jack? And he said, who are these guys? <laughs> who, they, who are these guys? They don't stop. It's lunchtime. <laughs> don't they stop acting even for lunch? <laughs> You know, wow. nobody's, nobody's changing character. <laughs> and I think that was the magic of that movie. Sometimes when you go on location, you're able to create a world unto itself. And Jack, being the most well-known of our cast and, and the most experienced, is always like that. He's like a coach. And one of his other real talents is he wants everybody else to be as good as they can. Right. Because he knows that's what makes a good movie, not just him starring and standing out, but the whole ensemble, I think it was a big part of what made the movie so good. Well, that's incredible. And so when your father finally got to see the movie, what did he think of Jack's performance? He was, he was knocked out. He said, you know, son, if, it's, if it wasn't going to be me, then at least I'm glad it was Jack, because he's great. Oh, and I'll wow. tell you that. Wow. Wow. I still don't forgive you, son. I still don't forgive you. <laughs> well, well, Buffalo of the Cuckoo's Nest became the second of three movies to sweep the Academy Awards winning picture, director, screenplay, actor, and actress. How special, because this was your first uh, producing credit after, after doing some film and, and coming off uh, the streets of San Francisco to, to have a movie sweep the Oscars. What was that like, like for you? And what, did Jack, uh, what was Jack like after he won his first back Best Actor Oscar? Well, we, we had nine nominations. And the first fight was to get Jack to even come to the Oscars. He had been nominated three times before and had lost. So he, we finally twisted his arm to come to the Oscars. He did not want to come. And now we have nine nominations. We lose the first four. Jack is sitting right in front of me in the theater. He turns around to me. He says, Mikey D, Mikey, I, I told you, Mikey D, this is no good. This is not going to be good. Hang, hang on. I said, hang on, Jack. Hang on. <laughs> and then we proceeded after losing the first four. We then went on to win Best Screenplay. Best Director, Best Actor, Best Actress, and, and Best Film. And uh, before I, I, I get off, Scott, I really have to acknowledge Milos Forman and the extraordinary job that he did as an actor. Louise Fletcher, who uh, was played Nurse Ratchet and, and, and won the Oscar. But it was an, inc an incredible night when, 
we, we rolled them off those, those last five. It was quite amazing. Well, amazing. this was amazing. Talking with you, Michael Douglas. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for calling in. I cannot tell you how much this means to us and to just movie fans around the world and, and the, the, on the 40th anniversary of Lum Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest. I mean, this is really a big moment for me and Alicia to talk with you. Thank yes, you so thank much you. for calling in. Thank you, Scott. In. Thanks, Alicia. Have, Have a great you. one. You Can't too. Can't wait to see you in Ant-Man. <laughs> <laughs>